Hello and welcome to the Indie Beginning Podcast. It is our goal to bring story lovers and indie authors together through reviews, dialogue, and unique topic discussions. Sad news in the Indie Beginning family this week. Marie's grandfather Don has passed away, and I wanted to take a moment for us to send our thoughts and prayers to Marie and the rest of our family. I'd also like to take a second to send my thoughts out to the universe. Living in different states, we weren't able to visit as much as we had liked. It's hard breaking through that Minnesota Game of Thrones style ice wall. But when we did, Don was always so happy and full of stories, which I can only assume is where Marie fell in love with books. Don will be missed, and I am saddened to say goodbye to a wonderful man I wish I knew more. It is only fitting, and somehow universally frightening, that we have already scheduled the story Fossils by Robert A. Webster. This story follows a geriatric group of rockers as they meet form a band, and become a sensation. They become so adored that they must flee many countries in order to escape their crazed fans, as well as the media and record companies. I will admit here that I adored this beginning and hope that you do as well. Don, I hope you're up there with a fish on a line and a beer in your hand. Have a story ready for everyone when we catch up. This indie beginning is for you. Headline from the Daily Nation the UK's best-selling daily newspaper. Mystery surrounds the pop phenoms. Great Britain is in the throes of a musical evolution. A new and exciting band has emerged with a unique brand of music that has captured the hearts and imaginations of the nation. Although the pop sensations only burst onto the music scene weeks ago, they've swept through the airwaves with a fresh sound, appealing to old and young listeners alike. Dubbed the New Beatles, fossils are taking the music world by storm putting British music back on the map with their unique sound. However, a mystery remains. Since winning the BBC's search for a new supergroup, nobody appears to know anything about the band. The country has become gripped in Fossil's fever. A spokesperson for Virgin Records said, with the number of pre-orders for downloads and compact discs of their debut album Hope, we expect a record number of sales when it's launched today. The band's manager, Kevin Nutley, was unavailable for comment and Billy Newman, spokesman for the BBC, was vague. He told supporters that the band is somewhere in Southeast Asia, performing for the underprivileged. He said that no photographs or information about the band were available. So where are fossils? The Daily Nation has received information that the band is now somewhere in the Angeles City, Philippines, and offering a £50,000 reward for photographs and information leading to the whereabouts of this elusive, vibrant young band. Track 1 Charles felt the walls closing in as his life fell apart. He longed to hold his wife, tell her how much he loved her, smell her fragrance, and hear her comforting voice telling him that everything would be fine. Standing with his hands clasped in front of him, he glanced over the gloss wood coffin placed on the conveyor. The faint hum of the conveyor echoed in the chapel as the curtain closed and the coffin moved forward toward the furnace. Charles's sons, John and Peter, two of the pallbearers, came and sat on the pew beside him. John patted his father's arm, but Charles just stared forward. John wept. Lorraine, Charles's daughter, with tears streaming down her face, gently squeezed his hand as the vicar prayed for the safe journey of Mary's soul. Charles wasn't listening and showing no emotion trapped within his earthly cocoon. Apart from being with his beloved Mary, nothing else mattered to Charles. With sobbing heard in the crematorium's chapel on the outskirts of Cleethorpes, the vicar finished his prayer and told the congregation to reflect on Mary's life. Charles gazed up as a ray of sunlight shone through the skylight. He gasped and smiled. Mary, he whispered, as an apparition of Mary's face as young woman appeared in the sunbeam. Hello, my darling, said Mary's voice in his head. Charles trembled and thought, Oh, Mary, I am so lonely and sad. I want to end this and be with you. Mary smiled. Charles remembered that smile, the one he fell in love with all those years ago. Mary continued, We will be together, my darling, but now is not your time. You still have plenty to live for. Remember what I always told you. Life is too short to be sad. Dad, sit down, whispered Lorraine as the vicar beckoned the congregation to sit. Charles, his thoughts interrupted, sat on the pew. The vicar went to the small pulpit and began his sermon, giving details about Mary's life, a woman he barely knew. 
Are you all right, Dad? whispered Lorraine, noticing Charles smiling up at the skylight. Charles ignored her. Where are you, my darling? Charles thought, watching rays of sunlight dancing through the empty skylight. Dad, are you okay? repeated Lorraine, squeezing his hand. John, hearing Lorraine's concern, looked at his father and gently nudged him. Dad! Charles juddered and smiled at John and Peter, and with glazed expression of tears in his eyes, looked to his left and nodded at Lorraine. Lorraine, relieved to see his tears, wiped them from his eyes with her sodden handkerchief. She kissed him on the cheek, faced forward, and listened while the vicar continued his sermon. Charles now felt warm, safe, and no longer alone. He glanced up at the empty skylight, and as the vicar's words became a blur, his thoughts drifted into happy memories. It was a warm summer afternoon when the removal van arrived and unloaded the Steinway Parlor grand piano into the recreation room. Throughout the day, the elderly residents came and admired the fine instrument, inquisitive about who was due to move into Albert's old room. Three in particular, excited by the piano, could not wait to meet its owner. The following day, a BMW came up the driveway. A middle-aged couple got out of the front seat and helped a gaunt but well-groomed elderly man out of the back. They took belongings from the back seat, walked into the residence, and went up to the warden's office. The curtains twitched as excited old folk tried to catch a glimpse of their new neighbor. John, Lorraine, and Charles sat in Mrs. Chu's office while she explained about the residence and the rules and regulations that Charles must abide by during his stay. The room smelled of stale tobacco. Hilda Chu was a small, haggard woman in her early sixties with stern features and a wrinkled face, which made her look like a constipated bloodhound. She had been the warden at the Fosdyke since it opened five years ago. Charles paid scant attention to the warden's instructions. His mind wandered elsewhere. Mrs. Chu then took them along a corridor. They stopped at a room on the ground floor and went inside. Here's your room, Mr. Clark. Or can I call you Charles? Charles shrugged as Mrs. Chu told him. This will be your home from now on, Charles. We put your chair near the bay window. The ground looks lovely this time of year. John put Charles' suitcase on the bed. It's nice and roomy, Dad, he said, opening the case and hanging clothes in the wardrobe. You have a television, but most of the residents watch the large one in the recreation room, said Mrs. Chu, pointing to a portable television and added, Your piano is there. I'll put your socks and your underwear in this drawer, said John, but knowing his father wasn't paying attention. Isn't it nice, Dad? And look, you'll have plenty of things to do, said Lorraine, waving the Fosdyke brochure at her father. It's not far from the beach, and you love the seaside. And you'll have plenty of company, said John, sniggering. Did you see all the new neighbors looking? Charles sighed and walked over to his armchair. Don't worry, said Mrs. Chu, and assured them. It takes time to settle in, but don't worry, he'll be fine. It might be better if both of you leave and give him time to get acquainted with the place. I am sure he will have more visitors come along once you've gone, she smiled. Lorraine nodded and said, Okay, Dad, we're going. We will let you get settled into your new home. I will bring Emma and the kids to see you soon, said John. Peter said he will come when he is not so busy. I will bring George and the kids to visit once you get settled, said Lorraine who walked over and kissed her father on the cheek. She felt tears welled up in her eyes as she saw the vacant, lost expression across her father's gaunt face as he gazed out the window. She stroked his gray hair, picturing the vibrant, caring man from her childhood. He was the same man who picked her up after a fall, taught her how to play the piano, and appreciate the beauty in music. The man who she could always depend upon, and the man who she never imagined would end up this empty shell. Bye, Dad, croaked Lorraine, and with tears streaming down her face, walked towards John. Bye, Dad. See you soon, said John, putting his arm around his sister, and along with Mrs. Chu, left the room. Charles stared out the window over the manicured lawns. His room smelt like the rest of the place. It had an eggy, musty smell, usually associated with old people's homes. For Charles, it was not and never would be home and hoped his stay here would be short. He gazed around the garden and watched a bumblebee disappearing into a rose, reappearing moments later. It clumsily flew past butterflies, airing their brittle, colorful wings. Sparrows chased each other, flying low past Charles's window, and while nature went about its business, he 
he reminisced about growing up around the entertainment business. His mother was an opera singer, so she had gained a love for music at an early age. His father, disappointed by his son's chosen interest, expected Charles to follow him into the army. Charles was 12 years old when his father was killed in Ireland. His mother encouraged and tutored him into becoming a vocalist, but having deformed vocal cords, untreatable at the time, gave his voice gravelly sound. She knew he would be unsuitable for classical singing, so she bought him a Steinway piano. That sound. That opened up a new and exciting world for Charles. He practiced hard and became a talented pianist. The Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra employed him soon after leaving Surrey University. Charles was 22 when he met Mary. She was auditioning for a violinist position in the orchestra. Charles noticed the pretty young blonde in her interview when she played Paganini's Capri, number 24, in A minor. Joseph Fletcher, the orchestra leader, impressed with her performance and with Charles's prompting, employed Mary. Charles and Mary grew close, and after a short courtship, married. Mary hailed from Cleethorpes on the Lincolnshire coast off of England. With property prices being cheap in the seaside resort, they bought a five-bedroom house on the outskirts of town. They played with the Liverpool Philharmonic for four years before Charles accepted a position in the prestigious London Philharmonic Orchestra. They realized that Charles's new job meant he would be spending a lot of time touring, so Mary left the Liverpool Philharmonic to go with him. However, she fell pregnant after their second tour with her first child, John. Charles spent the next few years touring the UK and abroad, while Mary remained at their Cleethorpes home raising John. She gave birth to two more children, Lorraine, followed by Peter a year later. The years passed, and with Charles spending most of his time away from home, he and Mary decided that he'd find work closer to Cleethorpes. He taught music at a local college, where he stayed until retiring. Now their grown-up children had families of their own. Life was idyllic for Charles and Mary, who spent their days either in each other's company or with family members. They spent evenings with Charles playing his piano and Mary playing her violin, until the scourge of leukemia took Mary and Charles's world fell apart. A knock on the door interrupted Charles's thoughts. Hello, Charles. The evening meal will be served at six o'clock, so you need to go to the dining area now, Mrs. Chu shouted through the door. I'm not hungry, Charles replied. Suit yourself, grumbled Mrs. Chu and walked away. Charles relaxed back into his chair and recalled the events leading up to him ending up in the residential home. He thought about his uncaring children. During the wake, John put his arm around his father and said, Dad, remember what Mum told you to do when this day came. Charles glared at his son and said nothing. John sighed and walked over and talked to his brother and sister. Once doctors diagnosed Mary's illness... Mary, Lorraine, John, and Peter arranged for Charles to move into Fosdyke Residential Home as soon as Mary passed away. They arranged for Charles's piano to be moved to Fosdyke so he would feel comfortable. The family organized everything without involving Charles, who, although angry when he found out, said nothing, not wanting to accept the inevitable. After the wake, Charles was alone in the house. He played his piano and drank himself into a stupor thinking about his life and his emptiness without his rock, Mary. John arrived mid-morning and went over to his father, noticing the empty whiskey bottle and knocked over a glass. He shook his father awake and said, I'll make a cup of tea, Dad. Why don't you go to bed, and I'll bring one up to you. Charles got unsteadily to his feet, went upstairs, and got into bed. Family members turned up throughout the day to help with the move. With only a few personal items allowed into the residential home, the family sold the rest of Charles and Mary's belongings and divided the proceeds between them. While the removal company took his piano and cleared the house, Charles remained in his bedroom. Several hours later, the house was bare apart from Charles's bedroom furniture. Lorraine had brought food for Charles throughout the day, which went uneaten. That evening, Charles walked around his empty home, desperately wanting to join his beloved Mary. John and Lorraine arrived the following morning to collect Charles. They led him from his house and drove 40 minutes to Fosdyke Residential Home. Another knock at the door disturbed Charles's thoughts. I am not hungry, Charles shouted, sounding emphatic, assuming it was Mrs. Chu. The door opened and a small rotund man, as bald as a bellend, walked in. 
Charlie boy, shouted a jovial geriatric in a gruff voice. With a cheery grin, he went over to Charles. I'm Steve, but they call me Strat. Chewy told us you weren't coming out to eat, so I thought I'd come change your mind. Shocked, Charles forced a small smile and said, No, I'm not hungry. Come on, just try some. The grub isn't bad, and tonight is barbecue rib night. A real treat, insisted Steve. He put his arm around Charles' shoulder to coax him out of his chair. I'll introduce you to everyone, said Steve, and sniggered. You can meet the band. Charles, taken aback, asked, Oh, you have a band here? I never heard about that. What type of music do they play? Steve laughed and said, It's a long story, but I'll tell you about it over supper. Come on, before the ribs get cold, and the other old farts scoff them off. Charles looked at the comical character, who resembled a weeble toy. He realized that he was persistent and would not take no for an answer, so he got out of his chair. Steve told him, It ain't bad here. I've been an inmate for five years and known in most pubs in the area. You'll be a big hit with the ladies with this posh accent. Steve chuckled and the pair made their way to the dining hall. The chatter in the dining room stopped when the pair came in. All eyes focused on Charles, who looked uncomfortable. I hope you old farts saved us some ribs, Steve growled. He led Charles to two empty seats between the other elderly gentlemen. Track 2 Within picturesque grounds on the southern end of the coastal town of Cleethorpes, Fosdyke Residential Home, converted from a guest house into a residential home by the current owners, had a two-story building with 23 spacious ensuite furnished studio apartments. The ground floor apartments had large bay windows at the front overlooking the large landscaped grounds, an idyllic tranquil location with the first room used as the warden's office. Two single-story buildings were in a short distance away from the residence block. One was a kitchen, communal dining area, and staff room, with meals provided three times a day. A larger room served as a recreation room where the residents could congregate, organize activities, and watch a large TV. This communal room also contained several smaller rooms where residents kept belongings locked away. It now had a Steinway piano placed near one corner of the room. With little happening at the home during the summer months, the old folks would either stroll along the boating lake, nearby beach, or relax in the gardens. It was a serene existence, and the residents varied. There were a few married couples, but it was mainly elderly single men and women. After Charles and Steve sat, the dining room was again full of chatter and clatter. Kitchen staff continued to serve the residents barbecue ribs and drinks. Although some struggled to gnaw through the pork with their false gnashers, it didn't stop them from giving the meat a damn good sucking. Charles looked around the room at his new neighbors. Charlie, meet Wayne, said Steve as he sat back as a man leaned over and shook his hand. Wayne appeared Latino, with black curly hair and a boyish demeanor. Hi, Charlie, I'm Wayne Logan, he said, shaking Charlie's hand. It's Charles, not Charlie, said Charles. What? Wayne asked. I said, it's Charles, not Charlie, repeated Charles louder. What? Wayne asked again, and then he said, I still have all my own teeth. Steve chuckled and said, Sometimes he's as deaf as a post, and he dyes his hair black. What? Wayne repeated and turned the volume up on his hearing aid. That's better, he said. Hello, Wayne, said Charles. What part of America are you from? Asked Charles on hearing Wayne's accent. Wayne frowned and said, I'm not a Yank, I'm Canadian. Oh, my apologies, said Charles. Hello, Charles, said the man on his right with a chirpy Cockney accent. I'm Elvin Stanley, but they call me Chippers. Charles Clark, said Charles, and shook Elvin's hand. He noticed that Elvin had several fingers missing. He felt uneasy and tried not to stare. Right, said Steve. Now you've met the band. Wayne and Elvin looked puzzled as Steve announced. After we've finished eating, we can go along to the recreation room and see what you can do on your old piano. Charles tried to imagine what instruments their band could play. With one as deaf as a dildo and another whose hand looked like lobster pinchers. Elvin and Wayne looked nervously at each other as Steve pointed out several other residents and relayed some of their weird foibles. Andrex Ethel, who walked around with toilet paper sticking out of her knickers, and Boring Bill, who people avoided, as all he had ever talked about was pigeons. Charles was eager to see his piano. 
So after they had finished eating, the four went to the recreation room and over to his Steinway. He sat on his piano stool, lifted the lid, looked at the ivory keyboard, and stroked the keys. The others stood around the piano. So what can you play? asked Steve. Charles smiled at the three and played Sergei Tanyev's Concerto E-flat. Several other residents made their way over to the recreation room, which was usually noisy as they chatted, played games, or watched TV. There was silence as they listened to the soothing music as Charles became engrossed in the concerto. Word quickly spread and a dozen residents came in. Charles finished 15 minutes later. He stared at the keys, reminiscing how the tune was one of his and Mary's favorites. He languished in his thoughts, while the recreation room remained silent for a few moments, and then the other residents applauded. Charles noticed his three new friends did not appear impressed. Mabel, a sprightly 82-year-old, started singing Lily of the Lamplight. Steve, looking disappointed, then asked, Do you know any rock and roll? Charles looked at the three and replied, No, sorry, I know some older tunes, but mainly classical music and opera. He noticed Steve, Wayne, and Alvin talking amongst themselves. Charles again tinkled on the piano keys and played a short Mozart piece. He stopped when Mabel came over and interrupted him. She barraged him with a request, so he played White Cliffs of Dover with Mabel shrieking along. Steve put his hand on Charles' shoulder and with a mischievous grin and through Mabel's toneless warbles said, Don't worry, Charlie, my boy. Me and the lads still have high hopes for you. Charles watched as Steve, Alvin, and Wayne went over to a room, unlocked the door, and went inside. With Charles trying to match chords with Mabel screeching, the three emerged from the room several minutes later. Steve carried a beaten-up guitar, a small Marshall speaker amp, and a microphone stand. Alvin had a large double bass, and Wayne carried two round drum cases. Mabel stopped screeching and gasped. Charles saw the look of horror on the faces in the recreation room as the three came over to him. Steve plugged in his microphone and set up the stand. Wayne set up his drums while Alvin tuned his old double bass. The room plunged into a panic as Steve adjusted the microphone stand. He tapped the microphone, and after a dull thump came from the speaker, he stood with a devil's glint in his eyes and snarled. Right, you old fogies? He paused for effect as the crowd trembled and growled. Strats back! Mabel shrieked. Ethel ran around trailing toilet tissue, while Boring Bill headed for the door. Wally, another resident, made a desperate plea. Somebody get Chewy and hurry! Steve plugged in his guitar and took a plectrum from his wallet. Here's my old faithful, he said, showing Charles the old plastic plectrum with an S hand painted on both sides. Alvin stood to the side of the large base, and Wayne sat behind his drums, smiling as the panicking residents rushed out of the room. Charles sat at his piano looking confused, as Mrs. Chu rushed in and hurried over to the fore. She gnarled at Steve and shouted, I told you not to set up again after the last incident. Don't you remember our previous conversation? Steve smiled and said, Just making our new friend feel at home. Besides, the rec room's empty, so we aren't disturbing anybody. Mrs. Chu became exasperated and yelled, It's empty because you scared everybody away. The same as before. Steve chuckled and told her, <laughs> This time will be different. We are playing along with Charlie's classical shit. He turned to Charles and instructed, Play her some of your music, Charlie boy. Charles, looking dumbfounded, played. Mrs. Chu stood with her hands on her hips and listened to Charles play a melodic tune. She knew Steve was manipulating her again. But he was the boss's father, so she couldn't say a great deal. Glowering at smiling Steve, she snapped. You have one hour and then be out of here, she glared at the four and stormed out of the recreation room. Good, Chevy's pissed off now. So now we can start, Steve said and grinned at Charles. Okay, Charlie boy, you can stop playing that crap and we can get down to playing some serious music. Rock and roll. Steve sang and pounded like a bald teenager as he played Johnny Be Good. He rocked away like a space hopper on steroids. Alvin struggled to pluck his double bass because he hadn't put on his little falsies. Wayne rocked back and forth, thumping out a beat on his drums, but unfortunately not for the same song. Charles sat at his piano while they banged out their renditions of rock and roll classics. He grimaced as he listened and thought he could feel his eardrums bleed. 
This wasn't music to his ears. It sounded more like cats being murdered. He understood why others had panicked in the desperate need to escape. Fortunately, Charles's torture only lasted several minutes. The three finished and looked at him. Well, what do you think, Charlie? Could you add something to make any improvements? Steve asked, looking pleased. A shotgun came into Charles's mind as he looked at the smiling faces of the proud, wrinkled rockers. He recalled what Mary always told him about not being good or bad music, only music that people either liked or disliked. Hmm. Perhaps you need to all come together with a little more harmony. You need a little more structure, he replied. The three nodded and smiled at each other. Can you help us with that? Elvin asked. Steve interrupted. Yeah, Charlie boy. You can help us and join our band. We will give your cool stage name. Charles knew this would be a challenge, but relished having something to keep him interested with this motley band of geriatrics and thought it could be fun. He smiled and said, I may be able to help, but please don't call me Charlie. What do you want us to call you? Steve asked. My name is Charles, so how about you call me Charles? Steve laughed. I'm known as Strat, Alvin's Chippers, and Deaf Boy over there, he pointed to Wayne, Sticks. So we can't just be calling you Boring Charles, announced Steve. How about Nobby? interrupted Alvin. The three looked at Alvin and asked, What? Nobby, repeated Alvin, and explained. In the military, anyone with the surname Clark was always called Nobby. Nobby Clark. Charles remembered from his childhood how he had heard people refer to his father as Major Nobby Clark, although unsure why. Charles pondered, looked into the faces of the excited old rockers, scratched his chin, smiled, and said, Okay, Nobby it is then. The three cheered and patted Charles on the back. Welcome aboard, Nobby, said Elvin and walked back to the room. He's gone to get his falsies, said Wayne as Elvin returned carrying an old hold-all. Charles watched as Elvin fitting homemade prosthetics to his digitally challenged hands. I will sound better playing with these on, said Elvin, waving his small Edward Scissorhands-esque attachments. One had an index finger and a thumb-shaped object set in various angles, which Charles noticed was the perfect shape and design for plucking the strings of the double bass. His left-hand prosthetic was just one small tube, which looked ideal for covering the fret streams at the neck of the instrument. Ingenious, thought Charles. Elvin noticed Charles' interest and said, These are me little falsies. I made a few of these for different occasions. These are my bass falsies. I also have me eating falsies, card playing falsies, lady pleasing falsies, and many more, which I will show you the fullness of time, said Elvin in his cheery cockney twang. Charles looked at Elvin's tatty old instrument and asked, That's a Flores, isn't it? Elvin, impressed by Charles' knowledge, told him, yeah, a Flora's Midnight Double Bass, which I bought many years ago when I saw it advertised for sale. Although it was a dilapidated condition, and held together by woodworm holding hands, I fell in love with the tatty old instrument, so I got it restored. I always loved playing the double bass and learned to play years ago before I lost my fingers. He again held up his hands, displaying the falsies, and proudly announced, And thanks to these, I still can. Charles Winston hoped Alvin would not play again. The four old musicians stood by the side of Charles's piano. Steve said, Well, lads, we still have 30 minutes before Chewy finishes ironing her wrinkles and chases us out. So what should we play? The others chuckled and Alvin replied, Perhaps Nobby can suggest something. Charles cringed. He looked at the eager trio and suggested, I suppose our first step would be to find something that we can all play together. I don't know any rock music, and I don't imagine you have sheet music for me to follow. So maybe we start with the basics? Sheet music, said Steve. I don't reckon that any of us can even read sheet music, he laughed. I can, said Alvin, sounding wistfully. Me too, said Wayne. I have also written a few songs. Steve looked shocked. He had known Wayne for almost two years and never suspected that this old Canadian had any musical education. You're a dark horse there, Logan, said Steve, and he grinned. Perhaps I could look at your songs, Wayne. We may as well learn them. At least then we will all be on a level playing field, said Charles. What? Charles repeated his request, but spoke louder. Okay, said Wayne. They're in my room, maybe tomorrow. Charles wanted to find out more about his new friends, partly because he was interested, but more importantly because he wanted to fill the remaining time to stop them playing more awful, ear-bleeding noise. 
How will this group of geriatric rockers go from nursing home antics to an international sensation? Can their tickers even take it? Fossils by Robert A. Webster is available on Amazon. Remember to leave a review for this story when you are done on Amazon or our webpage, acmbooks.com forward slash indie dash beginning. Please leave a review for this show as well on the podcast platform you found us on. Reviews are such an important way to support indie artists. Each review lets others know what you thought about their project and helps us create better content just for you. This episode was brought to you by Shirts by Sarah. Find the perfect shirt design over at shirtsbysarah.com. In the beginning is an ACN Books production. This episode was written, recorded, and edited by myself. I am your host, Benjamin Frankie, asking everyone to read more books, be the best possible you, and to simply enjoy this wonderful life. Thanks for listening. Now go hug your grandpa. <laughs>